we've got Laura Knight joining us as well. Vicky, if you want to come on to screen, brilliant stuff. Thank you so much. And we've also got Lucy Evans, and uh, we should have uh, uh, Rose Luckin joining us, as well as Grace and uh, Cesaris. Uh, I'm hoping uh, that uh, Rose is going to be joining us in a moment. And there we go. We've got a full house. Fantastic. Um, what I'm going to do, um, I'm, I'm assuming that you're all going to be in the same order um, on your screen as you are with me. So from uh, sort of top left to right is me, then Vicky, then Laura, and then across the bottom is Lucy, then Grace Ann, then Rose. Uh, so if that's the same for everybody, can you um, just pop your mics off unless you're talking, please, just so there's no feedback or anything. And uh, can I ask you very briefly just to explain a little bit about who you are, what you do, where you come from, um, and if you're from the UK, it's a bit like Blind Date, but without a date, uh, and I'm a bit like Silla Black, and you're just saying a little bit about who you are. Uh, so Vicky, over to you first of all, please. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Vicky Liogier, I'm National Head of EdTech and Digital Skills at the Education and Training Foundation. Now, um, if you don't know who we are, GTF is a national a professional development body for the further education and training sector. And uh, our mission is to work with teachers, trainers, leaders, governors and employers in supporting them in delivering excellent services and obviously my role uh, at ETF is with EdTech and Digital Skills, as I said earlier. Um, Brilliant. So that's it for me. I think I'm French, but based in England. Thank you. And uh, I mean, you may have seen uh, Vicky's message in the chat, some of the ETF uh, EdTech training resources that are available as well, which are superb, having had a look at those myself previously. Thank you, Vicky. Over to you, Laura. Uh, hi there, I'm Laura Knight. I'm Director of Digital Learning at Berkhamsted School. We are a group of independent schools uh, based in Hertfordshire in the UK. Um, I do lots of work on IT strategy, on training, on device provision, platforms and digital well-being. Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much, Laura. And what I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to save us 30 seconds because we've all met Lucy, Grace, Anne and Rose already. Uh, so I'm going to uh, just uh, jump straight into uh, the first question, if I could, please. Starting with you, Laura, you're a classroom practitioner by trade, but you also lead on technology in the school. And it's a group of schools as well. Mm -hmm. um, could you share, please, uh, um, where you've seen technology making an impact in the last 12 months? And I'm also mindful that you've got a really strong digital strategy in the school. So could you expand on what your developments might look like in the future? You know, um, you're, you're obviously embedding lots of things in, in, uh, uh, during lockdown and, and, the, and the pandemic. Uh, but what are you looking to explore and, and, and seek to invest in in the future, Laura? Sure. So let's uh, starting with impact over the last uh, sort of 12 months or so. And, 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 you know, as people have been talking about today, what a 12 months it has been. But one of the things that really I was, I was reflecting on this I was very proud of in our school community is how tech has really helped us um, to bring the community together not just in terms of the students and their teachers but also parents too um, it's been really wonderful to actually have a greater engagement with parents than I think we've ever seen um, and actually for parents to have that first experience of being in their classes with their children um, I think that's been really great in lots of ways um, so I do think we've been we've done some really great work on on creating learning experiences in in adversity but also some professional learning experiences too I think my colleagues I'm so proud of my school community and how far my colleagues have come mm -hmm. in uh, pivoting in such an agile way under pressure and in, in adversity um, learning new things applying their really strong pedagogical skills um, in contexts that are unfamiliar and I think that's uh, that's wonderful so in terms of moving forwards I think it's really going to be some interesting times we're, we're very fortunate to have made some big moves a few years back so now we're it's really about tweaking adjusting and constantly looking for where we can leverage the tools we've got to achieve better results um mm. so what have we got and what more can it do and adding those incremental shifts in um also looking at reducing friction so um there is no panacea we know this but there is no one single problem solving solution um that we can all just say right well let's buy that box and plug it in and it's all going to be fine. We know that there's lots of work to be done on um, making things join together well, making the experience seamless, reducing friction so that that mm. experience of learning, you just reduce as many obstacles to engagement and participation and success as you can. I also think there's something really interesting about the broadening of the 
um, the skill set of educators, um, and I mean that in the broadest sense, from librarians to senior managers to teaching assistants to all of those who work uh, with young people, um, because there is a there's a new design element to that in these online spaces that I think is fascinating. Um, mm. So we're going to be doing a lot of work on design thinking, on reflecting on how we can give teachers what they need in terms of production skills, actually. Um, think about mm -hmm. our, our school and its production values, reflecting on, on that sort of creation and curation of quality materials. It's not enough just to put things that might engage in front of mm. kids. Um, and I think we are, we're really looking at where do we add value? Where do we improve quality? Um, so that's going to be a really interesting thing. I think the, another thing that I'm fascinated about is, is how actually if we, by opening up the, the the four physical walls of the classroom, how else we can broaden student experience. And I, I love hearing about AR and VR, that's been fascinating. But I'm, I'm so keen to explore opportunities to um, allow students to have access to different experiences, immersive experiences, but also expertise. Who can we bring mm. to the classroom? And you know, we've been talking about Skype in classrooms and all that kind of thing for, for years now, but actually yeah. the barriers to that really being not just an occasional one-off gimmicky thing, but actually an embedded mm -hmm. part of the curriculum. That's now becoming really possible. And so I'm excited about that too. Um, and I think the final piece for me is about resilience, actually. Um, the more we add in terms of potential complexity and different pieces of these puzzles, the more we need people in our school communities, both families and children and staff across all of our sort of group, we more, the more we need to generate resilience and an ability to problem solve in the face of little challenges um, so that people can kind of build their way out of the difficulties they face. They can be flexible in their approaches to doing that. And I think also there's almost something computational about the thinking that's needed in problem solving there. So those kinds of skills need to be more widespread as we move forwards. That's really insightful. Thank you so much, Laura. And what I love about the majority of that was there wasn't really much actual conversation about technology. It goes back <laughs> to the conversations we've had throughout the whole um, uh, the whole day, really. Um, mm. Now we're talking we about had, people. Yeah. This is about people. The machines are like, yeah, that's yeah. just part of it. <laughs> And part of our job surely is to um, sort of create those conditions for success so these things come to pass you know yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, brilliant insights there thank you so much laura i'm going to jump across to lucy now lucy uh, you're the chief customer officer at frog in your presentation earlier you talked about and shared stories from schools uh, and this, this idea about real world learning uh, uh, that uh, frog uh, massively support uh, Given that Frog is used in so many countries, um, and in fact, is is you know, is a t the tool to go to for for some countries. In in fact, um, but given that um, uh, it's so prevalent, uh, where do you see real world learning using technology moving towards in the next few years, Lucy? Um, that's a difficult one uh, because every school is at a different stage in their their digital journey, I suppose. Um, a lot of schools already had strategies and systems in place that they are continuing to deliver their sort of education through. Um, how, how we are working with schools is very much around um, enabling schools to operate anywhere. So whether that be um, engaging parents in a certain way, whether that be looking at plugging the gaps in um, attainment and, and looking for those key patterns, or whether that be around um, social socialising online in a digital way, um, it, it really doesn't it really doesn't matter. But what schools have really been on a journey and all at different stages in their journey, they may have set out back in March, whereby they were looking at a, a way of getting um, access to resources from anywhere to mm. then maybe actually I need my students to see my teacher. I need them to interact with my teacher. Um, I, I can't replace my teacher. So how do I make that uh, more accessible to everybody? And mm. then parents now wanting to see more than attainment behavior assessment information they want to be engaged in the classroom and they want to see more and uh, so it, it's about the whole school not just taking um, a piece of teaching and learning it's about how do we operate a virtual school how do we deal with teacher student parent well-being and engagement throughout and i just see that as a continuation of mm. of school life 
Um, it's mm. it's just using, I think, Laura, you were talking about people, and it is, it's very much about the people and the skills and everything that you've got, but using the platform just to facilitate that. And that's how we see ourselves as a facilitator, nothing more. That's very interesting, uh, Lucy. I mean, it, what, what you're sort of summarising there is, again, a key, a sort of trying to sort of bring some of those strands together and strands from earlier conversations today. It all comes back to the, the importance of providing the opportunity to uh, foster, maintain, sustain uh, relationships, because relationships it is absolutely key the, the, between the, the child and their teacher, the child and their tutor, the, the, the parent and the teacher, all of that. And so that's 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 what I sort of get from from what you shared that and it's so 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 important and instrumental to the success of the child um I think it was Al who mentioned uh, somebody earlier mentioned about the uh, um, research by John Hattie into the importance of relationships we've seen that from the Education Lab Foundation as well too so it's great to uh, see you reference that as well and again not really a technology thing um as, as we heard from most of what uh, Laura was sharing as well um in, in the chat people sort of reinforcing that idea of the importance of resilience and things too so thank you for your input there um uh, lucy uh, jumping over now to vicky welcome vicky thank you for um joining us today i, I know you've been chomping at the bit to come in for the um uh, conversation today your work at the etf um it's got a specific remit you alluded to it in your introduction about yourself you've got a specific remit to support fe in the training sector so the question to you is how do your experiences compare to those shared so far and do we see similar levels of innovation in fe and the training sector as we see in schools is there a bit of a disconnect perhaps and then the final question really is, is what, what innovations uh, are you and, and the ETF exploring to further support teaching and learning in FE and the training sector in the future? Okay, um, so three questions really. In terms yeah. of uh, what uh, Lucy and Laura have shared, I suppose I can see a lot of similarities. Uh, first of all, uh, we are all recognizing that it is important for us to bring communities together and it is also uh, uh, about uh, creating initiatives for communities of practice. We also recognize that we are all on a learning journey and um, it's about broadening the skill set of educators where resilience and support is, are really essential in order to uh, to to bring success. Mm. So that would be similarities. In terms of uh, differences, I believe that Laura and Lucy are, are probably uh, working in a slightly different sector, in the school sector, uh, whether uh, uh, as a supplier or, or a, a school uh, manager. Um, GFE sector is very different from the school sector. It is different because uh, it's, a, it's got a really broad range of providers with independent training providers, general and specialist FE colleges, sixth form colleges, adult community learning, charities, mm. and so on. And uh, we also work in different pathways, such as offender learning in prison, where there is no connection to the internet or to technology, and therefore you need to work in simulations. Uh, ESO, uh, SANS, and you name it. We also mm -hmm. work across uh, a, a broad range of size of organizations where colleges can have 30,000 students and 2,000 members of staff. So you can see the challenges there are very different to the one uh, experience. Mm -hmm. However, um, we also work in that sort of dual professional professionalism sort of landscape where teachers not only need the essential digital skills for life, work, and, and learning, but also the tech skills, which are about uh, how do you harness technology to enhance teaching and learning, and also the dual professionalism, which means if they are working as a graphic designer, they need to understand the Adobe Suite and the latest uh, updates of the Adobe Suite. If they are, uh, mm. uh, a media teacher shall need to know about um, uh, <laughs> now a final cut, for instance, and that kind of thing. So that, that's what I mean by dual professionalism uh, skills as well. So what do we do in terms of uh, the second uh, point of your question, which is about uh, innovative uh, practices in FE? 
there are a lot of uh, innovative practices. I think FE has really come together uh, really well, especially uh, in, in, in that sort of crisis management and really supported each other. But we've, we've seen some um, innovative practices, for instance, at Bolton College with the AADA uh, virtual assistant, which gives mm. just-in-time uh, just uh, responses to queries for, from teachers and learners. Uh, there's, they are also working on the ADA uh, first pass, which is about assessment in real time, feedback. ADA goes to school, which is a crowdsourcing solution that allows teachers to set up subject chatbots for their courses. Virtual mm -hmm. reality in land-based sector with uh, Mieskov College, uh, Harlow College with uh, their supplying iPads to every student and every member of staff. And they've got a student ambassador, digital ambassador scheme to support the model. And they've got key, uh, um, key apps identified so that they can all use it. Yeah. Uh, USP College, where I am a governor, is also championing a UK network of virtually connected immersive teaching spaces. And within the college, they've got already 30 streaming rooms. So I, as you can see, there's loads of innovation taking place in mm. terms of collaboration across uh, FE. Uh, DFE has launched a GED Tech demonstrator schools and colleges, and with Basingstoke College of Tech and Arlo College be taking part, Grimsby College as well. Uh, yes. Blended Learning Consortium uh, is a group of colleges who are developing uh, learning content together. Uh, and uh, the College Collaboration Fund, which is also looking at uh, developing uh, content similar to the Oak uh, Academy. And then we've got a lot of communities online, such as FE Joy, UK FE Chat, and uh, other sort of communities. But let me tell you what we're doing at GETF. So at GETF, uh, we believe that our remit is to empower uh, educators. And uh, we see digital as an enabler. And uh, therefore, we've put in place a number of strategies to really support the sector in driving change. So we've got 80 EdTech mentors who are supporting their peers across England. Uh, we've got uh, some essential digital skills action research, which are currently taking place. And we've just uh, called for six critical explorations in EdTech, which are going to be very short and sharp on very sort of directed topics, such as accessibility mm. and inclusion. We also have uh, some OTLA uh, research projects, which are uh, about outstanding teaching, learning and assessment. And we are focusing on evidence-based practice. So uh, when um, COVID, uh, was uh, we moved into crisis management uh, in March and we uh, released 15 uh, webinars, well, in fact, 21, and we recorded 15 of them, which are freely mm -hmm. available to everyone. They were focusing on accessibility and inclusion to ensure that uh, digital uh, was uh, used, was actually encouraging and taking down barriers to engagement and facilitating uh, learning. Um, what else? Well, we've also got the Enhanced Digital Teaching Platform. And um, because of the diverse and complexity of the sector, uh, we decided that it was really important for us to have a common understanding of what it means uh, to effectively embed EdTech in our practice. And early on, Mark, you've mentioned the SAMA model. And the SAMA model is one of the models that we've used as part mm. of our digital teaching professional framework. And it was a, a collaboration with JISC and built from the six elements of digital capability from JISC, as well as the DCOMPEDU from the European Commission and uh, the 20 professional standards for the sector. And the difference with uh, um, D, uh, DTPF is that it came live, and it came live in uh, January 2019 with the Enhanced Digital Teaching Platform. And by March 21, it will be fully mapped with 175 
micro learning modules. So she enhance was designed to remove barriers to a professional mm. development. We know time is a major issue, and I'm sure Mark, you must be thinking, Vicky, time, time. <laughs> and um, because of it, we've uh, uh, approached it with uh, five minutes modules. We also have uh, taken down barriers to digital because of technophobia, and we've approached everything from a pedagogic uh, a lens. Uh, we also uh, adopted a user-centered design process to make sure that uh, the content actually met the needs and expectations of our fellow uh, educators in FE. And also you, with Vicky. embedded gamification. Just jumping in there, um, and yeah. I'll have to wrap it up with you just for a second. But what, what again is lovely, you know, we, we're talking about things where you're, it, it's about people again, relationships, providing the scaffolding, the supports. Um, it's great to see in conversations about teaching and learning, making sure that the training you're providing is, is not only uh, providing training which, which facilitates um, accessibility and engagement and inclusion, um, but also focusing again down, really deep down onto uh, uh, teaching and learning at the heart of it. If you could please, uh, Vicky, share the links so people can find out more about these things into the chat now that would be absolutely superb and uh, we'll be able to sort of uh, amplify that further after the event as well thank you so much for your insights there Vicky. I really appreciate that thank you uh great time welcome back to the stage and um i hope you're uh, doing okay there you look like you're about you're, you're sat in an igloo with with the uh, coat and the jacket on look you're, you're the amazon web services sorry you're the amazon web services ed stark global business development manager i wondered thinking about the future of ed tech what advances in new tech Technologies are you seeing being explored and developed from the, uh, the from the ed techs that you're working with? So yeah, I mean we've seen a a, a great um, rapid rise in AI and ML in particular, um, mm -hmm. and late in the year we started seeing a, an even bigger uh, interest in voice technology. And the one thing I do love about AWS and just going back to that whole people thing is we do work backwards from our customers. A lot of the mm. services that we offer is it's technology, but it's because people like the teachers are asking for a certain service. And so our, our technical pe people will go back and figure it out, right? So um, our team, the AWS Ed Start team started noticing that our ed techs were asking more about voice technology and we were we were trying to educate them about it and so what we did was we came up with a special offering for our just for our members and it is a voice building course it's a 15-hour course um and the our members who actually complete the course get some support from the alexa edu team mm -hmm. um they get a well architected review and we actually had a successful um at the end of uh, last year ecri um and just so that i'll make sure i'm explaining them properly their web-based writing assessment and evaluation platform and so they worked with um on the voice builder course um and they 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 have skills that help students with spelling grammar style sentence simplification quotes and citations and they're using voice as a natural extension of their platform and amazon alexa so that that's something that we're really seeing and we've been telling our ed techs um if you don't have a voice strategy now you you need to start thinking about it right because it's also really good for those um learners who don't learn by reading um and someone even asked a question in the chat room about that and i, I think it, it it's it, you know it's there it's the the technology mm. exists so we should be looking at that for our students no, I, I definitely agree with that. We see it in, in so many ways. Even if it's to, even if you take the AI out of it, just using your voice to leave audio feedback, that in and of itself is super powerful. But the, the, the ability to have you know a guide on the side who can help you when you're stuck at certain points without having to drill down into the real sort of nitty gritty of things that a teacher has to do, I, I can only see that as being something which is really uh, um, uh, going to be on the rise and rise and rise as we move into the future. Um, I did have a question um, for um, Rose Lucky because I think and say Rose has had to go unfortunately because we've, we've run over uh, time a little bit. But um, what if you've got some um, going back to this idea of using voice and, and uh, office assistance to support teaching and learning? Have you got an example of a of an ed tech that you're working with uh, that you could share with us, Grace Anne, about how, how that's working and, and how the ML and, and um, uh, AI behind the scenes is sort of making that work for them. Yeah, so ECRI was one of them, right? Where they take the um, they they they're actually helping them with the writing skill. I believe the way it works, and I'm not a technical person, so um, but the way it works is that the person actually 
writes and then it speaks it to them. And so it helps them with punctuation, but it also, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys do this, but when I, when I'm practicing for something, I speak into my recorder and I say, Oh, how do I sound? Most of the time my voice annoys me, but at least I can say, Oh, <laughs> I, completely left a word out of that sentence, you know, because I'm reading something that I've typed really quickly. So they're, yeah. they're the kinds of things that that voice can help with. I also think that, uh, I mean, you think the possibility of like the blind, right? Um, and being able to use that voice technology to speak so they don't have to worry about with the, the braille and, and not feeling like they're being left out. Um, uh, I don't know, the, the possibilities are endless. There's, there's so much out there. <clears throat> they absolutely are. And what, what I love about it is being, you know, if, if you go back 10 years in education, you know, accessibility was, was, was you know, not a, a term that was used very frequently. And to be fair to it, things like you know, well-being and, and mindfulness in education <laughs> weren't either. There's been a real sort of shift forward in that. I want to wrap up the um, debate now, really, just bringing a question to all of you. So I'll just, just uh, do this to you, Grace. I'll just bring us all back in. There we go. Happy days. Um, just a question and uh, a quick round robin to all of you, a nice short response if you could please um uh, does anyone have any final points um they wanted to talk around uh, any sort of shifts towards the future um in the absence of rose being able to join us her question uh, was um uh, sort of asking her about um uh, sort of develops further into ai and and, and uh, those sort of things if you've got any sort of if, if i could, if i could give you all a crystal ball right now you know what would you be seeing um in in five years time uh, in in, in uh, education and um i'm going to give you all a second to put your hand up rather than just going laura you go first if you're not ready uh, then that's absolutely fine uh, who'd like to uh, have a go first at that question there so five years time what we're likely to see is that it is being a, 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 a sort of game changer and and being sort of de rigueur as it were um in in uh, in education who'd like to go first on that one accessibility of tech i think i think we're going to definitely go see on, a then. change in the accessibility of tech um you know i i think that was a, that was a really big problem in the very beginning of covid where you know not all students had access to the internet and i know we scrambled to get devices in the hands of students to help them so i think in five years time you're going to see um just some changes in the way we get Wi-Fi into our homes and things like that, just to help with students. So I'll, I'll leave that there. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you, Grace. And Laura, what was yours? Well, actually, I was also gonna mention about how I hope that we will see the narrowing of gaps. Um, there yes. are too many inequalities in this space, and I hope that we can uh, improve upon that. But I also think that we can, well, I think there's huge scope to allow the top end, the creative, exciting, innovative end to make sure that it stays focused on the pedagogy. And we are thinking about how we deliver curriculum, how we deliver content to kids week in, week out. And it's not just those flashy special events. Kids need to learn every day. So how can we make things really work for the classroom? Brilliant stuff. Thank you very much. Um, did Vicky or Lucy have anything to add to that? Um, pretty much the same as everybody else. I think from my perspective, it's more about uh, breaking down the barriers, making sure that uh, everybody has equal access to through um, wireless connections, etc. So that exactly the same can be delivered across the globe. But mm. also I do see um, a, a bit of a step backwards. So although there's lots of talk about artificial intelligence, etc, etc. I do see that actually recently there's been a, a very big um, gap which has been teacher interaction so I see a lot a lot more teacher interaction thank you ever so much Lucy Vicky do you want the final word on that one then please yeah um, to be honest um, I, I, I think the the COVID uh, has really sort of been inspiring in in seeing how communities came together and uh, it worked as a catalyst and I think we're really going to build from that and see mm -hmm. in five years time probably hybrid classrooms will be quite common, flipped learning will be adopted with uh, a sort of uh, active uh, learning taking place when, when you are face to face. Personalized learning of course and uh, differentiated learning with uh, take, uh, accessibility tools empowering learners and all of us really uh, so um i think we're all going to become learners and uh, in gfe white paper it's recognized that 
uh, we we are we all need to embrace lifelong learning, and uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and again, I, th I think it's lovely that despite the fact we're at an event that's called the future of EdTech and we're talking loads and loads about EdTech, it's great that loads of the conversations have been about people, relationships, uh, shifting the bar forward, you know, all those things. So um, brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insights, uh, all of you. And uh, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us today.